Hi, everyone. It's a real privilege to be here today. I want to thank NetRF for the opportunity to be involved in this patient conference. Today, I'm going to be talking about watchful learning and surveillance of NETS. I'm going to start with uh, just an over overview of what it means to do watchful learning. I'll talk about why this might be a potentially reasonable, reasonable strategy for patients with NETS. We'll talk about some of the advantages of watchful learning, and then we'll also talk about some potential downsides. What is watchful learning? Well, I think it's important to know there are actually several terms that can be confused, confused with this or perhaps overlap with this, but some very similar terms would be active surveillance, also known as active monitoring, and watchful waiting. And all of these are forms of what we call expected management or deferred therapy. So what is expected management? Well, this is closely watching a patient's condition but not giving treatment until symptoms appear or change or there are changes in test results. And this avoids problems that might be caused by treatment such as radiation or surgery. So when we talk about active surveillance or active monitoring, this is typically reserved for the curative setting. So this is a treatment plan that involves very carefully watching a patient's condition but not giving treatment unless test results suggest the condition is worsening. Active surveillance involves doing certain exams and tests on a regular schedule for the patient. And this is used in certain types of cancer where, for example, the treatment may actually have some significant side effects associated with it. If the tumor's in a difficult location, for example, in the case of a certain type of melanoma uh, in the eye, um, or even in prostate cancer where the surgery might be a pretty big deal in the patient uh, and relative to the size of the original tumor. So the idea with active surveillance is that it's designed to minimize risk or overtreatment of early stage disease without reducing survival. So what are some uh, potential uh, applications of this to NETS? Well, I think a couple of areas rise to the top. One would be multifocal pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in MEN1 patients, where we try to avoid a lot of surgery in this group because we know they're at risk for recurrent tumors or new tumors. And also small asymptomatic pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, where there's a growing body of data that some of these can actually be watched and don't necessarily need to be removed. But I would acknowledge this is not yet well studied and additional studies are needed. So what about watchful waiting? Um, this typically applies to advanced or unresectable disease. And the idea is to watch a patient's condition before moving on to actually start treatment. And you actually only start treatment if this, the uh, condition is progressing. And I would say the classic, classic case where this has been developed is in prostate cancer. Uh, and the idea is that when the risks of treatments maybe are greater than the potential benefits in a patient who's otherwise doing well. And I think, you know, in, in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, uh, I've been asked to talk about the idea of watchful learning, which I think is a term that Josh Mailman may have uh, coined. But I think it kind of pulls together uh, the act of monitoring as well as watchful waiting in one fell swoop. And the idea is just that we carefully monitor a patient's condition without giving treatment until the symptoms or test results suggest that the tumor is progressing. And this is really well suited for a slow growing tumor like neuroendocrine tumors when the risks of therapy in some situations may outweigh the potential benefits. And here, when I talk about risks, I'm talking very broadly because in addition to the obvious things like side effects, also things like the financial toxicity, impact on convenience, time, or quality of life for a patient needs to be considered. Now, during watchful learning, patients certainly can have tests like blood or urine biomarker tests or other tests and regular imaging to assess for changes over time. And I wanna point out to you that we actually do a mini version of this all the time in regular uh, care of patients. When patients are diagnosed, the workup often takes several weeks to months. And during that period, there's often serial scans or labs that are done when we haven't yet started therapy. And this sort of min miniature version of watchful learning is a time where we can learn more about the pace of the disease and the underlying tumor biology before we choose a therapy, which may include continuing to do this watchful learning process. And I do think actually this is potentially applicable to early stage disease, as I mentioned, as well as advanced and unresectable disease. So why is this a reasonable strategy? Well, first and foremost, we know that low-grade neuroendocrine tumors can be very slow growing, and some of our patients ultimately have their disease for not only many years, but in some case, 
some cases decades. And therefore the growth is often measured in months or even years instead of days, days to weeks. And so we also know that a number of our treatments slow, slow tumor growth, but often don't shrink them. And we know that in the advanced setting, our treatments don't cure the tumor either. And so treatments like somatostatin analogs and everolimus and sunitinib are known to mainly cause stability rather than shrinkage. And even PRT with lutetium-177 mostly causes stability and only causes shrinkage in a minority of patients. There are some other treatments that are more likely to cause shrinkage, such as uh, uh, using chemotherapy or liver embolization, or uh, in some cases, surgery, which is the ultimate form of debulking. But of course, these are um, have more risks associated with them. So an example, I think, that's a really good one of how slow growing the disease can be is in the clarinet study. So this was a randomized phase three study of lamreotide or placebo in GI and pancreas neuroendocrine tumor patients. And the point I want to make is that the median time to tumor growth as assessed by imaging was 18 months in the patients getting placebo. So that's a year and a half, meaning half of the patients progressed before then, but half of them progressed after 18 months. So it gives you an idea of how slow the tumor can grow in some patients. Importantly, there was no difference in overall survival, which means that many of these patients went on to get lanreotide or other somatostatin analogs later on and there didn't appear to be a detectable uh, change in the overall survival or difference between people who started it right away and who started it later on. And there was no difference in overall quality of life in this study. So this really raises the question in some patients, is it safe to wait to start therapy? So watchful learning has actually already been incorporated to some extent in the guidelines that we use as physicians and healthcare providers. Um, it isn't called watchful learning in the NCCN guidelines, but if you look carefully under the localized uh, well-differentiated neuroendocrine neuro tumor guidelines, for the small non-functional pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors less than two centimeters, observation, in fact, is listed as a reasonable option with serial imaging, of course. And then the other place that we listed is for uh, multifocal pancreatic neuroendocrine in, in uh, MEN1 patients. And as I mentioned, we really try to hold off on surgery unless tumors are uh, more than two centimeters or if they're growing uh, uh, fairly rapidly. Now in the advanced disease setting, um, we know that um, the guidelines suggest that treatment is clearly indicated when you need control of symptoms. So that could be from tumor bulk or the primary tumors causing a blockage or there's hormone mediated symptoms from hormone excess. And also it's accepted that if the tumor is growing on imaging, that it's time to start therapy. But it's also accepted that for asymptomatic patients with a low burden of disease, really of any, any site for a well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, it's reasonable to consider observation as a first step. And I would put that under the category of watchful learning. Now, what are some of the potential advantages of watchful learning? I think certainly for the patient, there potentially is less time at the doctor's office. We can avoid risk of side effects and complications and hopefully preserve quality of life. It limits financial toxicity, hopefully. And in some patients, I, there may be psychological benefits in that some patients report they don't necessarily have to feel like a patient, meaning that they're not coming in and getting active therapy and you can delay that, that part of their disease course. There's also benefits from a provider standpoint in that it gives us a better sense of the pace of the disease. We can watch it over time. Um, it can help us to plan out our choice or sequence of therapy over time as we get a better sense after seeing serial images, how fast this tumor is growing. And it allows us to minimize over-treatment. Remember, um, we often say in this field that it's a marathon, not a sprint when we're treating low-grade disease. So it allows us to individualize care for patients. And I would just point out two areas. Again, one would be MEN1 patients where you really want to watch over time to see where tumors may be and which ones are growing and be very strategic about your intervention. And then another category of patients that I think is very worth thinking about are older patients where if they have a slow growing disease uh, uh, from which they don't have any symptoms, it may be very reasonable to just watch and wait and uh, follow over time before uh, starting therapy where the side effects could potentially be uh, more significant uh, than the tumor itself. So what are some potential downsides of watchful learning? Well, we know that some patients find it very stressful to hold off of therapy, and I think that this is definitely worth acknowledging. 
Um, there's also always the concern that we might miss a window of opportunity for treatment. This is especially true if somebody has borderline kidney or liver function or if their tumor is more rapidly growing. But I would point out this is pretty unlikely if you're following a patient care carefully and if you're doing it in patients with low burden of disease. And I would argue that you can minimize this risk by getting a short interval follow-up scan. And I'll often get my first scan after only two months after diagnosis, just so I can get a sense of the pace of disease. And then I spread out the interval between scans thereafter, depending on uh, what we're seeing on the scans. Is watchful learning for everyone? And I would say no. Uh, again, it, I don't think this is a good strategy for somebody who's symptomatic from hormone excess, who has a large burden of disease, who has pain from a tumor, or if they're suspected to have rapidly growing disease. Uh, again, this is really best for asymptomatic patients with a low burden of disease. So to summarize, watchful learning is a reasonable strategy in some net patients, particularly for those who are asymptomatic with a low burden of disease and a re relatively low KI-67. And I should mention that a uh, study I showed you, the Clarinet study, only included patients with a KI-67 less than 10%. So we have less data related to the higher KI-67 tumors. So we really need to tailor the interval for follow-up based on the biology we're seeing. There are a number of open questions, including if this really does apply for all nets. Um, we don't have as much data, for example, in paraphio or lung nets. We also don't yet have tools for predicting which patients for whom this would be the, a great strategy. Uh, and it could be in future years, we'll have more information about histop histopathologic findings like KI-67, molecular markers, uh, features on imaging, and maybe ultimately we'll be able to come up with what's called a nomogram or sort of a little calculation that allows us to know the patients that are most likely to benefit from this. And ultimately, I think we do need to do more studies to better incorporate the patient perspective so we can better understand as providers the pros and cons of this type of strategy. Thank you very much.